Hey there! Welcome to the Flit 360 podcast. I'm Dr. Heidi K. Begay, and I'm a flutist, educator, coach, and podcaster. My God given mission is to serve you. I am passionate about guiding you, the modern day flutist, to discover your unique voice on and off the stage. The goal of this podcast is to help you thrive, both as an artist and as a musicpreneur. Go ahead and grab some espresso, your favorite notepad, and let's get to it. Today's episode 229 is titled, Not Getting Grant Money? Try Corporate Sponsorships. Hey, 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 friends. Thank you so much for tuning in and happy new year to you. I am stoked because we are wrapping up the Ultimate Music Business Summit right now, and my adrenaline is still flying high. Now, if you have missed out on UMBS 2023, no worries. You can still go to musicsummit.biz, that's musicsummit.biz, and you can claim your VIP ticket. Now, there are two different types of VIP tickets. There's the air quote regular one, and there's a student VIP ticket as well. So go ahead and grab that offer because you can access 30 plus videos for the next 12 months. So I preface today's episode with all of that because I am gifting you my UMBS talk. I have re-recorded it because I want you to add another income stream throughout your business portfolio as a modern day flutist. If you're not getting grant money, if you are unfortunately maybe not accessing or tapping into scholarship money, think outside of the box. Corporations, businesses, they want to work with you. I know firsthand. And this is a beautiful time to segue into an amazing announcement. The Flute 360 podcast and the Carolyn Nesbaum Music Company in Plano, Texas is partnering. We're partnering together for 2023. So I want you to check out their website at flute4u.com if you are a performer, a teacher, a student, and you need flute accessories, music, repair, etc. They are your one-stop flute shop. I am so blessed beyond measure to have such an amazing business partner and friend in Carolyn Nesbaum. So because she is Flute 360's exclusive sponsor for 2023, I want to teach you the same principles that helped me gain an amazing partner. These three secrets are going to help you gain and tap into an income stream that perhaps you didn't even know existed. So take out that stylus, take out the tablet, jot down some notes, and I really pray that this content serves you well. Enjoy! Hey there, my name is Dr. Heidi K. Begay, and I am so pumped that you are here at the Ultimate Music Business Summit 2023. Thank you so much for carving out time to be here with us, and huge Thanks to our corporate sponsors. And speaking of sponsors, we are literally going to talk about how you can obtain corporate sponsorships for your creative project. I don't care if you are a composer, a conductor, a teacher, a recording artist, a musician, performing artist. I'm losing the different roles that we play within the industry, but you get the gist. I don't care what hat you wear. You can get corporate sponsorships. Ooh, podcasting. If you're a podcaster, YouTuber, content creator, you can get corporate sponsorships. And this is so vital. And we're going to talk about my story as a podcaster. We're going to talk about some success stories. So that way I can put a little bit of fire flame under your tush and get you really excited. And I'm going to break down my top three secrets. So I want you to know that 
all of this came about through trial and error. Okay. So I didn't read a book. (laughs) I don't think there are a lot of resources actually, to be very honest. I don't think that there are a lot of resources specifically on how to obtain corporate sponsorships for your creative endeavor. Not saying that this is the bee's knees, but because there was a lack of information, I had to really just learn from my mistakes. And I just really had to put my fishing pole and my line out there and start, you know, uh, what do fishermen do? Fisherwomen do? (laughs) They cast the line, right? And then they reel in the bait to see if they caught a fish. I had to do that over and over and over again. And then you start realizing as an educator, you know, kind of taking a step back, you realize, oh, this is working. This isn't working. And then you jot down those observations and then you start realizing, oh, there's a strategy here. I don't have to completely pull my hair out every single time. I can make this work for me. So a little bit about myself, if we have not met. My name is Heidi and I am the creator of the Flute 360 podcast. We are going into year five and we have produced over 230 episodes and I have learned a lot through this podcasting journey. Now, I won't go into complete um, detail about how the podcast came to be, things like that, but let me just say that this was not on my radar. (laughs) I was thinking that I was going to be an academic, full-time, tenure-track flute professor at a university. That's what young Heidi said at 13 and at 33. My plans completely changed. And because of that, I am so blessed that it actually worked out this way. I am very, very thankful, actually. So with all of that being said, because I wasn't planning on being on this untraditional path, I really had to learn as I went down this path. I really had to learn, um, not necessarily by myself. I did have career coaches. I did have um, help and mentors help me with the pivot. But specifically when it came to corporate sponsorships, I learned this information through trial and error. So around episode 30, 40, I think like six months in, I was really banging my head against the wall. And the reason being is if you've ever created (laughs) one blog post, one podcast episode, one YouTube video, one social media post, you know that it takes a lot of time to do it well, just like anything. And so around 30, 40 episodes, I was like, huh, what if I started making money off of my podcast called Flute 360? Well, the reason why I didn't go really gun ho about it at first is because, again, remember, I was thinking, oh, I'm going to apply to these academic positions. So Flute 360 was kind of in the background doing its thing. And I thought it was going to be a great resume builder. I thought it was going to be checking off those boxes of creative activity and publications. And some search committee was going to be like, oh yeah, this girl has got it all down. (laughs) We're hiring her. Well, come to find out I was hired through an international school, but then COVID hit and I had to pivot. Bye-bye job. So Once that job went away, that's when I had to really give it my all. So I was tinkering with corporate sponsorships in the beginning um, because it was just an additional income stream and it was extra cash. But then when I pivoted, I had to then get really creative and I decided, okay, I'm going to have to boost these different income streams throughout my business portfolio, more students, more gigs. Um, And that's where I want it to be. So I'm saying like more this, more that, as if, you know, it it sounds like I didn't want to be there. I did. Um, But we all know that we like to have, especially me, I like to have food in my belly and a roof over my head. And I like to have those basic needs met. 
Who does it? I'm saying more because I wanted to have my basics covered and then some. So that way I could, that way I could enjoy life. So I just started boosting up all of these different streams of income. Okay. So now I've pivoted. Now I've decided, all right, I am not going to make Fluta 360 no longer a hobby or a resume builder. I am going to make this a marketing arm that's that's shining a massive light onto me. What I do, the product services and offerings that I offer to my community, how I can serve them through XYZ. Okay. So this is why, and I've changed my slide for y'all just because I love you so much. <laughs> Notice the doink. Um, so through the pivot, okay, I didn't realize that if you, and again, this is what makes me sound doinky. It's, it's so simple of a statement, but there is so much value and so much punch to this statement, okay? And this is what Arthur Gare and I were saying at the beginning of the weekend in the plenary session. And I don't think I did it justice. So as I was thinking, oh, my podcast is a hobby. I was getting hobby results. If I was approaching my podcast as a dissertation, which it was, then I got dissertation results, which meant I got to graduate with my DMA. Once I was approaching it as a resume builder, guess what? I got job position results. I was offered a job. Then when I started approaching the podcast as a marketing arm to my business, I was getting business results. And if there's nothing else that you get out of today's conversation, that is golden right there. You have to be sitting in the CEO chair of your music business and be thinking along those terms, okay? Because as I was treating it as a CV builder, I wanted business results, but I wasn't able to articulate that within that particular season. I wanted different results, but I didn't know what that was, okay? Then I realized, oh, if you plant corn, you get corn. If you plant wheat, you get wheat. But if you are planting corn, guess what? Wheat is not going to sprout. And that's what makes me sound really doinky. And I'm just going to use that word again because apparently that's my theme for the weekend. Um, it makes me sound really silly and really ignorant. But it was a huge aha moment for me. It was massive. So the minute I had this paradigm shift, then I started thinking about and how can I obtain that ROI that I was looking for, okay? And corporate sponsorships was one stream that I started really boosting through my business portfolio, okay? Now, not just Flute 360, um, but a lot of my clients and a lot of people whom I have worked with within the past year or two have seen their own success stories as well. So for Flute360, I am really proud of this, and you can see my face is lighting up a lot right now. And that's because over the course of the first three years, three and a half, we worked with over 30 different companies. And I am so blessed beyond measure that these companies believed in the podcast, they believed in the value, they believed in the content, they wanted to partner and come alongside me, and they really wanted to serve our flute community, okay? And a lot of these businesses actually were repeating customers. So you know that they were seeing results, which is really exciting for me because I'm providing them a service, and if they're coming back, that means that they're satisfied, okay? And then moving into uh, year four, four and a half, where we are right now going into year five, well, we're at year four and a half right now. So at year four and a half, we have just um, signed a contract to have an exclusive annual sponsor for 2023. And that is the Carolyn Nessbaum Flute Shop in Plano, Texas. So 
I am extremely blessed to have a friend and a colleague and a partner in Carolyn for her to believe yet again in Flute 360 and say, I want to come alongside you and I want to support you. Let's support each other. And that's a big deal to lock in an annual partner. That's huge. She has committed and I've committed to her for the next 52 weeks <laughs> that Flute 360 will be putting out weekly episodes from now until December 2023. And I'm so thankful. Now, the funny thing is that annual sponsorship um, happened for various reasons. And it's a part of my story. And it's a part of the three secrets that I'm going to give you today. Okay. But just side note, I'm not going to go down this rabbit hole for too long. Stick with me. Side note, when I was shifting from going to, you know, earlier, I said I worked with 30 different companies. That was on a month to month basis. Now, y'all, I cannot stress this enough. Kid you not, that's great. Wonderful. Love the work. But going to the well every month <laughs> with a new company through these sponsorships was pretty exhausting near the end. At first, it was like, okay, yep, get the ad read, get their information, get their links. And then you do your four, six episodes, and then you switch, and then you move to the next company, and you do it all over again, wash, rinse, and repeat. Again, great money, fantastic, great to build these relationships. But going to the well constantly every 30 days, oh my goodness, at some point, it was just like, hmm can I be smarter about this? And I was starting to think actually around uh, probably two months ago, kid you not. I mean, this literally went down very, very recently. About two, three months ago, I was thinking, let me shift over to quarterly sponsorships where I am locking in with one or two companies for three to four months. And as I was thinking, is that possible? What would that look like? What would those numbers look like? Carolyn came to me and said, let's do an annual sponsorship. I don't even want to do quarterly. I don't want to do month to month. I don't have time for that. This is too good. We're going to do a year. So I say that because I want you to think big. I want you to dream big. Businesses want to work with you, okay? Don't underestimate your value. Don't underestimate the impact that you bring to your community, whether it's the parents or the students or the audience members or the band or the band director. You bring tons of value, okay? So in addition to 360 and those success stories, I've helped other creative artists, um, composers, musicians with their podcasts, uh, YouTube channels, uh, music festivals, events, nonprofit organizations, you get the gist. But it adds up to over about $60,000 worth of sponsorships. So I say that because I want you to get really excited. That's proof in the pudding. Okay, that's proof in the pudding in of itself that this can be a reality for you. All right, perfect. So I'm curious, you are a creative artist, you are a musician within your niche. Let me know what your specialty is. Are you a performer, a teacher, a composer? Let me know. And do you have any creative plans right now? something that's currently brewing on your stovetop or something that's kind of been brewing and simmering in the background for quite some time. I would love to know. Drop your comments in the chat box below. Awesome. So you would want to obtain corporate sponsorships for various reasons. I put down my top four reasons why you would want to consider this partnership. So speaking of partnerships, that's reason number one. Excuse me. Reason number one is to anticipate and get excited and look forward 
towards making great business connections and building meaningful relationships. This nugget in of itself, you guys, I could sit here and talk for the next hour on reason number one alone. I was kind of, you know, practicing and as I was preparing for today, one of my little dress rehearsals that I was doing in my office, I teared up actually when I came to this slide and reason number one, because if I, as I was saying these words out loud through my little dress rehearsal, I realized and I was reminded of the impact that these business owners have had on me as not only as an individual and as a business owner, but yeah, somebody who was wanting to move the needle forward within her own business. And these relationships hold a special place in my life, in my heart. And I really mean that. So, you know, the ladies who I worked with through the William S. Haynes company, they are no longer there, but they went on to be marketers for, I believe, a B company and a financial agency. That... Uh, Second lady, Christina, actually, she and I many years later reached out because now she's marketing for this financial firm. And she um, onboarded Eric, my husband, and myself through a financial PowerPoint discussion about retirement and all of that. And Anna Marie talked about that on Thursday. And come to find out, um, the agency that she was marketing for Uh, We really liked their values and we really thought that they could help us plan financially our retirement accounts and savings, get out of debt, things like that. So we actually hired this financial expert uh, two years ago, and that was through a relationship within the flute world years before that. So it's crazy. You know, these relationships evolve. They are not stagnant. If if you allow them to be stagnant, that's okay. You know, not every relationship is going to scale. But for Christina and I, in that particular case, it moved into a whole nother industry and we got to work together in a completely different capacity. These are my friends. And then specifically talking a little bit more about William S. Haynes Flute Company, they, five, six months after their initial sponsorship with Flute360, they actually invited me to the largest flute festival in the world at the National Flute Association in Salt Lake City, summer of 2019, to be a part of their booth. And I was doing guest live interviews within their booth. And that was from a very simple monthly podcast sponsorship. And just three, four months later, They are flying me to Utah to be in their booth with them. How cool is that, right? And uh, Katie and Christina, again, through William S. Haynes Company, and I keep bringing up the Haynes Flutes Company just because they were my first sponsor. They were the first ones who believed in me. They were the first ones to sign over a check and say, yes, I want to partner with Heidi. And they are a pretty substantial (laughs) uh, flute maker out in Boston. And so I'm really proud of that partnership. But Katie and Christina, the way that they interacted with me, the way that they talked in meetings um, about the podcast, about Utah, I was blown away, literally mind blown. The way they articulated ideas, what I got to learn about marketing, graphic design, Um, Their thoughts about table arrangements, the exhibit layout, things like that. I learned so much in those meetings that I still use and implement those nuggets within my day-to-day life today. So when I say reach out to obtain corporate sponsorships, yes, essentially we're looking for a check to cover our costs That is reason number two, to bring in another stream of income. That's reason number three. So that way you are sustained and all of these reasons, right? 
But at the core of it, it's people. Okay. And then vice versa. Think about what you can do for them. Think about how you can elevate this business. Think about how you can serve them, reach their business goals. Think about what lessons they can learn from you and their relationship with you. It's an amazing world that we live in. And we have the capacity to reach out to pretty much anyone, right? Throughout the entire globe at just the touch of a click of a mouse and pulling up a web browser. So we live in some phenomenal times. Use that to your advantage. So my three secrets, shh, <laughs> I'm being silly. Uh, my three secrets include knowledge is power, position yourself wisely, and wrap your offering with a bow. And we're going to talk about swalking it. As you will see, side note, I swear my ADHD is really kicking in. Um, side note, you will see like between the doink, doinky, whatever I said, and swalking. Of the three executive committee members of UMBS, I tend to be, well, Garrett and Arthur are colorful in their own ways, but I tend to be the silliest one. So anyways, I digress. So I say that because thank you for your patience with my silliness. I like playing with you. All right. So this is just a bird's eye view. Okay. These are my three secrets. Knowledge is power. Position yourself wisely and wrap your offering with a bow. We are going to go into detail within each one of these secrets. So here we go. Secret number one. So before you reach out, I... I'm pausing because I'm chuckling at myself. I hear what I want to say next, and I want to go two different ways. Okay, so before you reach out, I want you to do research on your industry. But this is the part where I was kind of smirking and smiling at myself. And that is, yes, do your research, know your industry, know the nuts and bolts of your project, understand the company that you're reaching out to, but don't sit here for too long. (laughs) Please, 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 please. I don't want you to plan too much where then you get into this space of overthinking. Oh my goodness. When I start working with clients on this, they can research all day long until the cows come home. Okay. Let me tell you what, because then when it comes time to picking up the phone or sending out an email, right? They will just be really timid and be a mouse and they will go into a corner and be like, yeah, I'm going to research more. I'm still being productive. No, 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 no. So yes, you know, my grandfather was a carpenter and he would say, measure twice, cut once. But, and that's good because once you cut, That wood is cut, right? If you measure for too long and you don't actually saw the wood and you don't actually cut that piece of wood, then you're not going to build your house, (laughs) okay? So that's my loving piece of advice to you. Yes, measure twice, cut once, but get to the cutting sooner rather than later, okay? So... You want to understand the market, okay? You want to understand your audience and you want to understand your project like the back of your hand. The reason why I say this is because this is imperative for you to kind of gather your thoughts, do your research, because when you go into a phone call with this company or an email with this company, they will ask you questions. Now, if you have some answers in the back pocket just to kind of pull out and be like, oh, actually, I'm so glad you asked, da, 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 da. And then you can give them your answer per the research you did. Now, I don't want to like freak you out here. You don't have to know every answer to all of their questions. (laughs) It's impossible, right? 
you don't have a crystal ball. But if you know the majority of the answers to their questions, like say about three or four, and you can just, you know, really come across as super confident. And we're going to talk about this in the next slide, that confidence sells. But if you can come across as really confident and knowledgeable within your industry, then they're sold. Kid you not. I kid you not. I have seen it time after time after time again. Okay. And then if they come to the fourth or fifth question and you don't know the answer, it's not going to bother them. They're going to be like, okay, she knows what she's talking about. I'm completely convinced. I'm not even worried about that. So specifically the market. Now, speaking from a podcasting musician's point of view, I like to know podcast statistics. So there are podcast websites out there that offer these statistics. Whatever your niche is, do some research. So for me as a podcasting musician, getting corporate sponsorships for my podcast, I better know the podcasting industry. Who listens to podcasts? What are their hobbies? What is their family life like? Are they young, middle aged, or older? Are they going to school? Do they have college degrees, et cetera, et cetera? So, knowing the demographics is essential because we want to essentially have brand alignment with said company. So, if a flute maker is really targeting, uh, for example, say they just have, this is kind of rare, but why not? Let's Let's just go with this example. If they sell just beginner flutes, right? And your podcast listeners are only professional flutists who probably play on platinum or gold $50,000 flutes, then guess what? There's not a brand alignment there. (laughs) There's another doink section for you. So you need to understand the company, what their vision is, who your audience is, because they will ask those questions in the preliminary and follow-up conversations, okay? So this is why you need to know, second bullet point there, you need to know your audience. Are they students? Are they amateurs? Are they professionals? Okay, do, would they plan a beginner flute, a step-up flute, or a professional flute? You need to know these things. What are their hobbies? What are their likes? What are their dislikes? What career are they in? Okay. And yeah, you know, kind of paint a picture of who this person is. Create an avatar and make sure that it's based on facts, not what you think and what you perceive your audience member to be. Okay. Because when I started started off Flute 360, I perceived that my audience member was a younger me. I thought, ooh, if I, if I only knew this information when I was 20 years old, where would I be now? Come to find out, <laughs> I was about 20, 30, 40 years off of my demographic. I was not talking to the 20-year-olds. I was talking to the 50-year-olds. Kid you not. That's the average podcast listener of Foods 360. So know your audience. You want to know about 25% of those people, okay? Founded in Dallas, Texas in 1996, the Carolyn Nesbaum Music Company is renowned for its international service for flutists of all levels. The Carolyn Nesbaum Music Company is your premier resource for everything flute. Their selection of flutes, piccolos, low flutes, and head joints from dozens of makers is truly remarkable. Also, their offerings of sheet music, instrumental accessories, teaching, and health resources are unmatched. Their in-house staff offers an unparalleled level of expert knowledge and personal service with an in-house repair staff certified in all major brands. Follow the Carolyn Nesbaum Music Company through Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter to be updated with the latest news. Check out their website at flutforyou.com. The Carolyn Nesbaum Music Company is truly your one-stop flute shop. Great. So 
Now that you've gathered the facts, you are going to feel way more confident. I promise. Trust you me. And with that knowledge, with that boost of confidence, then when you go into emails, when you go into phone calls, it's just going to exude from your being. I promise you. And that's not going to hurt you at all. If anything, that's probably going to lean in your favor where the company is like, yeah, I mean, they might not even know a lick about podcasting, but if they see that you're passionate about the project, you know your industry, you know your audience, you know how you can bring that company value and you are confidently showcasing that to them in the correspondences, oh my gosh, that in of itself could sell them on you and your endeavors. Again, just to reiterate, companies will ask you questions. They will, because at the end of the day, it's a business transaction. They want to make sure that it is a sound investment on their end. They have a budget, they have a boss, and they need to kind of crunch numbers, reorganize numbers, budget, and stick to their budgetary needs because they're only allotted so much money per quarter or per the year. So they have to be really smart about their investment, and that's why they're asking you questions. They are essentially hiring you. Some phone calls that I have been on, and I've been on a lot for these enrollment calls with businesses, don't be surprised, and this isn't a bad thing, and I'm not trying to make you nervous at all, but just an observation. A lot of these calls for me uh, felt like an interview. And at first I was kind of taken aback. But when I was relaying that nugget to actually a client of mine, she looked at me and she's like, yeah, so what's the big deal? And I said, what do you mean? They should just, and I kind of, you know, not that I was being mean or anything. I was just thinking in my head, like, they should just trust me. They should just, you know, um, and she goes, well, they actually are kind of hiring you for a job. That's why it felt like a job interview. So there's going to be different styles. There's going to be different people, different personalities, like anything else. Um, So just be open to the possibilities of uh, different things like that coming up. I wasn't expecting to feel like some of these calls to be a job interview, and some of them were. Other calls were more informal. Some were super short. Some were super long. So just take that into account. The other thing that I want you to do before you reach out is I want you to know your worth. Okay. So there's a little exercise that I want you to do, and that is to write down 20 to 40 value points. Why would this business sponsor you? you and your project? What makes you and your project unique? These are some questions that they're thinking about in the back of their mind. So get inside of their head. What would they be asking themselves? What are they curious about? Um, And jot down the value that you would bring them. Again, going back to the past slide, they are needing to make a sound investment. Convince them that you literally are the bee's knees, (laughs) okay? You are all of that in a bag of chips. Toot your own horn, okay? As musicians, I think sometimes we have a really hard time with this, um, except for flutists, right? Little joke, I'm a flutist. And I think we have a really hard time with this because, again, we don't want to come across as arrogant or whatever the case may be. You won't. I promise, especially if it comes from this very genuine place, they're going to see that. So the reason why I want you to write down these 20 to 40 value points is because seeing is believing. I want you to put it on a whiteboard, a chalkboard, a tablet, a document, something that you can pull up every stinking time to remind yourself of the value that you bring to the table. And this is imperative because, again, it's going to boost your confidence. And remember, 
confidence sells. Okay. And here's a little trick. I actually use my 25 value points as a reminder to me five to 10 minutes before I go into a sales call. Now, again, I'm using this word very loosely, sales. I like to say sales as enrollment, but I'm saying sales right now because everybody knows what I mean, but sales is dead, okay? You are enrolling this business into the possibility of them sponsoring your music creative project, okay? So before that sales call, that enrollment call, um, I am looking at that list. You better believe it. <laughs> I know that Food360 has 230 episodes. I know that there are X amount of people listening to it every single month. I know this. I know that they are winning auditions because of the content. I know that they're going into graduate school because of the content and the impact that it's made in their musical journey. But I have to see that. I have to remind myself of what that value is because at least for me, I get nervous before something like that. So the value points grounds me five to 10 minutes before said call. And I think it could really serve you well too. If you want to see 25 of my value points, it is in the Google Drive through the link that I have provided through the chat box, okay? So click that link and pull up that PDF file. It is titled value points. Now, when you pull it up and you're like, this isn't impressive, this looks pretty actually generic and kind of a scribbled mess. Yeah, I am showing you exactly what's behind the curtain. I didn't change it for y'all. There are fragments through that list. A lot of the wording probably only makes sense to me, but I wanted to show you that it could take you five to 10 minutes to do it. It doesn't have to be fancy. You don't have to use a fancy Canva template, although you can, whatever inspires you, whip it out, (laughs) get it down on paper and pin it to your office wall. Okay. So know what makes your project unique. Okay. You don't want to be, I'll just take my characteristics as an example. I walk into a room with other people. There's a diverse audience. There are some um, perhaps uh, Native Americans, indigenous people, African Americans, Caucasians, Europeans, Australians. You get the gist. There's a mix of us, right? Uh, Hispanics, okay? So say that there are like 10 15 white women in the room. How am I going to stand out from the other 10 to 15 white women? Okay. She might be the shortest one. That's not something to remember a person by to be the short white Caucasian woman in the room. So I say this because you need to lead with that uniqueness. You need to be able to know like, Hey, And I'm going to use Hilary Abigana as an example. She is a flutist and I have interviewed her through episode 86. So check that out. And she talks about her uniqueness, actually. She has pink, red dyed hair. She's a flutist and she's not just any flutist with pink hair. And there are a lot of flutists with pink hair. She is a Cirque du Soleil flutist and she has a trio with her two male counterparts, uh, a brass player and a percussionist. Okay. And they go on tour and they do hoops and they have torches that are lit up by fire. And she's doing flips on these guys' backs while she's playing her flute and piccolo. Kid you not. That's how specific you need to be. You need to say, I am the fire hoop spinning flutist. Okay. Get really, really specific. Okay, cool. So moving on secret number two, you need to position yourself wisely. Okay. So a lot of times people will say, well, who do I contact? Okay. If you position yourself well, the company will see you. 
with all of your glory. Okay. So your net work is your net worth. And it's funny because when I hear this question, I empathize with you. I kid you not. But people who start pursuing corporate sponsorships, <laughs> they their biggest thing is who do I contact and what's the price going to be? Like the price that I actually propose to said company. And I have to chuckle because it's like, who do you not contact? Like as long as there's brand alignment and your value syncs up, the sky's the limit. Contact everyone within and under that umbrella. But I get it also because it's like there are a lot of possibilities and that can feel overwhelming too. So I empathize with you completely. So again, just think of a funnel, like the Caucasian woman example, right? I don't want to be one of many. I want to be one of one. All right. I want to be seen as an individual. So do the same thing with the industry. Think, you know, about the music businesses out there. We're all musicians. Done. Okay. Let's just say, hypothetically, there are 100 music businesses out there. Cut that baby in half and say, okay, of the music businesses that are out there, I'm a classically trained musician. All right. Cut that in half. I'm not into pop or rock or anything like that. Classically trained. All right. Now we've cut in half. All right. And then you just go down the list. I'm a flutist. All right. I'm a classically trained flutist. And start thinking of the companies that are in alignment with that. Flute makers, flute festivals, uh, music apps, practicing apps, et cetera, et cetera. Flute repair shops, sheet music for flutists, teaching supplies, accessories, et cetera, et cetera. You get it, but get really granular and think who would be in alignment with you and your brand because you want to make sure that it's a heck yes from them. If I am going to, and again, music and arts is still within the music community. I could go to music and arts. They sell some flutes. But their main niche are guitars, rock and roll, percussion, drum sets, right? So it could work, but they're just like, maybe they're more on the fence of, yeah, but no. So you want to find the win-win-win for everybody involved. You, the creative artist, the company, and the audience. Because essentially, why are they partnering with you? They're possibly partnering with you because they want to get their brand in front of an audience, their ideal customer. So if they're slapping their logo and their ad read onto something that's not going to move the needle for them in sales or customer retention, then why would they do it? Okay. And for the audience member, you don't want to put an icky, gross taste in their mouth. (laughs) And saying that out loud, I'm thinking of like prosciutto or something. Anyways, so if the audience member, specifically through my music based podcast, were to hear Doggy Chow, they might be taken a little aback, right? Because they know I'm a cow lover, they know that. I don't really get into dogs. (laughs) I'm a pet lover. Don't get me wrong, but I'm a cat lover. I have four fur babies. Okay. So if they hear and they know that about me, then they're not going to want to hear something about doggy chow. Um, And also, you know, you don't want to bombard your content if you are a content creator or you're teaching or performing residency. You don't want want to bombard your audience with too many ads, with too many sponsorships. So you need to be selective. Okay. So when you start thinking about who you want to partner with, here are some places to start. These are some places to begin your journey as you are figuring out who you want to contact. Okay. You want to contact current relationships. You want to contact where you are the consumer. Where do you shop? What product service or offering are you religiously buying every day, every week, every month, every year? 
Because if you have faith in their product, then you're going to be able to sell it. Again, I'm using quotations here. I'm using this term very loosely. You're going to be able to sell the company's offerings through your endeavors to their ideal clients with ease. It's going to feel really organic. So like with Carolyn Nesbaum, that annual exclusive sponsorship felt really good for me and Flutes 360. Why? Because back in 2009, she and I began a friendship. And actually before 2009, as a student, I was buying music from her shop all the time when I was in undergraduate, graduate school, doctoral school, getting my degrees. Then in 2009, she and I were actually bona fide friends because I was bringing my students to her shop for flute trials and flute repair. So it's only natural that she and I would partner moving into a sponsorship like that because we've known each other circa 2009. So where do you shop? And then after all of that, if you're just like, Heidi, I have no freaking idea who I'm reaching out to. All right. Well, then you need to make some friends. <laughs> Love you, but that needs to be a huge priority on your to-do list, okay? Reach out to five new people every week, every week. And I know that sounds like a lot, and you're probably like, there is no way, yes way. And I, and I say five a week, and that's actually a little too low, but I, I'm being nice. I'm gently bringing you into this idea. I probably reach out to 10 to 20 contacts a week. But start off with five and then go from there, okay? And it's mainly because I love getting to know people. I love building new relationships. And it's actually kind of a high for me. I love hearing people's stories and journeys. And I love learning from people. So anyways, I digress. Um, if you want to know more information about building new relationships, you want to listen to episodes 173, 174, and 175 through the Flute to 360 podcast. Okay. Now on the flip side, you may or may not hear through the grapevine that don't cold call. Cold calls don't convert. Yeah, they probably don't convert as well, but I would be remiss not to share this with you. I have seen for myself and for my clients, cold calls working, okay? I have actually probably received through 360 about, not a lot, but about $1,000 to $2,000 worth of sponsorships through cold calls, okay? So they have power as well. But all in all, your network is your net worth. That, it, that is extremely important. And if you build these relationships and you are strategic from a very genuine and authentic place, the sky is the limit. And I am going to use Serena Huang as an example. She is one of our two fabulous UMBS interns. And I got her permission before this presentation to embarrass her a little bit in a very good way. And she agreed. So thank you, Serena. And she reached out to me because I did a Facebook post and I said, hey, we're looking for UMBS interns. Is anybody interested in helping me obtain corporate sponsorships for UMBS? And she said, yes. And she said, well, what are the details? I sent her those details. We were all on board. She's hired as an intern. Fast forward, she and I become friends. Okay, we're working together every week. We see each other every week in meetings. We're giggling. We're the two girls among the five of us. So now I have a girlfriend on the team. She's also a flutist. We're about 10 years apart and we hit it off. She positioned herself very well because now I'm using that word very loosely. I know Serena's heart. She did not think, ooh, what can I get out of Heidi? Ooh. 
No, she was thinking, how can I grow as a musicpreneur? What can I learn from Arthur, Garrett, and Heidi and John? How can I improve my abilities through this internship? But because now she's in my orbit and she's on my radar, she's in my contact list. I can text her. I can call her. I have her email address. This is smart positioning. Now she is learning from the four of us. She, we're learning from her. We're building a relationship. And in a matter of weeks to a month, she's taking a class of mine, learning about corporate sponsorships in detail. She and I have probably one or two one-on-one sessions. That's it. I give her some direction. She goes with it. And then what comes out of it? Three to four sponsorships for the lost creative database. And that the time span between her initial, hey, I want to be your intern, to getting four sponsorships for her podcast and database was probably, and Serena, if you watch this, you can correct me if I'm wrong, it was probably three to four months. That's it. That's it. And to position herself in a way to say, yes, I will help you guys through an unpaid internship. How smart of her, right? To get herself in a position where she's like, all right, I'm making new contacts. My net work is growing. So her net worth is also going to grow in tandem. Learning about these skills through the class, learning from the executive team, uh, implementing what she saw in the UMBS's back end to her own world helped her out and built a stream of income for her and for her colleagues. How cool is that? So what can you do about positioning yourself? So secret number three is we are going to seal your package with a kiss. We are going to swack it. So I was giggling at myself when I was going through this um, presentation and building these slides um, because I think a couple years ago, I used uh, an acronym, KISS IT, uh, keep it simple, smarty, and now we're swacking it, and it also pertains to a kiss. So, mwah. now, we want to wow your reader. We are going to put together an initial email, okay, and you are going to briefly talk to this potential partner, okay, like They're your best friend in a professional way. You're going to tell them who you are, what you're passionate about, what you are passionately working on, what you love about their company, and how you want to serve them. Make it about them. If it's a lot of me, 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 I do this, I do that, look at me, I'm top dog, I have all these titles, they're going to go snooze. Very similar to what Garrett was talking about on Thursday, okay? He was talking about putting your audience, your possible client or consumer in the limelight so that way they feel heard and seen, seen and heard, okay? So I want you to paint a really clear picture for them. So when you say, this is what I'm about, this is what the project is about, this is how I see us coming alongside as partners. Are you interested? And by the way, side note, that word partner, (laughs) this is a coaching tip, that word partner or partnership goes a long way with these folks. They love that word because it feels, and of course, It has to feel true to you and your being, okay? But just side note, if you want to use that word, you can. It has gone a long way for me. Okay, how can we partner? How can I come alongside you and support you? This is the win-win-win that I see for everybody involved. What do you think? Okay, keep the email super short because the... CMO, the chief marketing officer, is very busy. (laughs) 
very, very, very busy. They are putting out different marketing campaigns. They're writing blogs and newsletters and calling TV shows. They are doing a lot. So did you notice how I said this email is going to the CMO? That's their job to think of unique marketing campaigns that they can get their hands onto, okay? You don't want to, unless for some reason you know the CEO, you don't want to, nine times out of 10, don't reach out to any other department because the business owner, that's not their job, okay? Um, Yes, maybe ultimately they have to approve of the CMO's budget, in plans for the year, but don't reach out to the CEO. They're going to probably throw it away or they might forward it to the CMO if they if they didn't forget. I mean, they get thousands of emails every day. And you know, as a teacher, as a performer, as an administrator, whatever you do, we all get bombarded by so many emails. So send it to the right person and you have a better chance of them opening up the email. So when you go to the website, and I'm going to use Carolyn Nesbaum as an example, about us, you're looking for the sales manager or the chief marketing officer. Their email is usually listed right there. It takes a a little phishing, not a lot, but you'll find it, okay? Um, And then if you can't find their information, then find a sales representative or... Uh, customer care, something. Okay. So you get the picture who you send it to really matters. And then as you've finished up your brief email that you're getting right to the point with all the details, you want to attach any files that are pertinent to your cause. Now, don't go crazy with this, all right? Attach a picture, attach a performing tour, a teaching tour schedule, um, your podcast or blog content upcoming schedule. Talk about and show them how you put thought into the project, how this is your baby, how much you care about this endeavor. Because if you can paint them this really beautiful picture and they can see it, they can feel it, they can taste it, they're going to get that much more excited with you. And the chances of them saying yes, go way up. They get, you know, their, their excitement goes way, 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 way up. I promise you, you can even embed some links within the text of the email. Don't go crazy with this either. Maybe a couple links, maybe to your website, maybe to the tour schedule, maybe to a YouTube channel with some music examples, okay? But people scroll through emails, I promise you. You know, we have now, because we live in this informational age where so much is being thrown at us, we have the (laughs) attention span of a goldfish, (laughs) okay? So you need to keep it brief. And if they are kind of scrolling, a lot of times, at least I do this, even though I'm not reading everything necessarily, I if I see a link, I'll click it. And if I go to that link and I see pictures and sound clips and a schedule and some kind of form, I'm going to get really pumped up about what you are putting out into the world. So those are some things to think about. So I know that I am probably way past my time, but I just want to leave you with this encouragement. And that is you bring value to your community. You have and hold an impact um, like no other. And businesses want to work with you, both small and large. Okay. Don't underestimate the small businesses out there and don't think, oh, that's a big fish over there, music and arts or guitar center or Haynes flute company. Don't think they're too big for me. I can't reach them. No, 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 no. And no, (laughs) if your project of course is in the baby state, then maybe guitar center is not uh, feasible for this season, but 
as it's growing, it could be appropriate within the next quarter, the next year. So don't underestimate yourself. Okay. You can do it. Um, If you have faith in yourself, you're really passionate about the project. You find a company that is going to be in alignment with yours, then it's a win-win-win. Okay. And as you can see, there's some strategy here, right? Who you're reaching out to, CMO. That's very specific. So yes, you're dreaming big, but if you actually apply these three secrets, then you are going to see results. Okay. Awesome. If you want more information, go to Flute360, episodes 173 through 175. I have been a guest through uh, two specific shows that talk about corporate sponsorships a little bit more in detail. So if you're interested in obtaining that information, Christine O'Donnell's podcast, E42, is where I am talking about this very thing. And she asks different questions. So it's not going to be this exact information. Same thing with Jace Crafts podcast. That is episode eight. Okay. Follow me. I would love to continue this relationship. Thank you so much for being here. You can find me through Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, all of those social media platforms. My handle is the same throughout my entire name, Heidi K. Begay. And fun fact, my husband's name is Eric J. Begay. So we are J.K. Begay. Super cute. And then I have two podcasts, Food360, as I mentioned earlier. And the second podcast is with my friend and colleague. And as you may know him as friend or as host of this great event, uh, Dr. Garrett Hope. And it's called The Pivoting Musician Podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Let's scoot on over to the live Q&A and I can't wait. Thank you. Let's talk about flute.